Well, welcome to Spindle City Straight Talk. I'm CJ. And I'm Chip. And we have an interesting show for you today. As we've been talking about over the past couple of shows, um, I had filed a complaint with HUD in regards to the floor of a community development agency. Now, in filing that complaint, um, Mr. Dion was re required to file a response to the complaint that was prepared, and he did that. And I received this copy yesterday. Here it is. Very large copy. Pictures, everything. But I had a meeting with him on Monday, and we discussed several of my major concerns. The first of which was the Florida Office of Economic Destruction. Um, and my problem was they pay 45% of Ken Fiola's salary and the salaries of all the employees of the Florida Office of Economic Destruction and uh, Jobs for Fall River, which is their mother company, I guess. And I asked how that's benefiting Fall River. Um, and the beneficiaries are supposed to be low-income individuals. And those are the guidelines to receive that money. But there is no guideline for proving effectiveness. And that was my big concern, was that there was no guideline for proving effectiveness. Um, one of the interesting things I found was that the Florida Office of Economic Development doesn't receive any funds from the city of Fall River. Their budget is provided, 45% of their budget is provided with CDA money. Um, and that's very interesting because the other 55% comes from other grants, I guess fees and services that they provide, um, including the loans that they write and whatnot. Um, but they, residency um, is not a requirement for the people that are hired by those companies. 100 jobs were met for last year's requirements um, for the CDA. And all of those people proved to be uh, extremely low or low income. Um, and they actually have to provide a report every year saying what they provided, how they did it. Um, and they have to follow up every year with those reports. Brian Pearson does a lot of the um, statistical gathering uh, for these grants. And it was very interesting to see that they actually get timesheets from the Florida Office of Economic Development. And they check those timesheets regularly to be sure that they're not going over the 45% guideline, nor are they going under it. Because if they're going under that 45% on a regular basis, such as 30 or 32 or 35, they would, have, they would say, we're not going to pay you 45% anymore. Um, the money from CDA that I found out, used by the Fall River Office of Economic Development, again, must be Fall River businesses, but they don't have to be Fall River residents. And there's no way for them to actually follow up on that. And by bringing that up to Michael Dion, he says, well, maybe we'll have to look at that in the front. Um, and the reports that were provided did not have a resident count, how many Fall River people were actually hired for these low income or extremely low income jobs that they had found. Uh, the other thing I found out is that the Fall River Office of Economic Development, when they always say we have 800 jobs or 700 jobs on our website that people could apply for, when you look at those, they're not jobs that the majority of the people of Fall River can apply for. So, I'm, I mean, it's very um, detrimental in some respects to say we have 700 jobs or 800 jobs when actually those are for doctors, lawyers, and accountants. Another issue I brought up was Perry Long and Perry Long's salary, where he went from what I thought 40000 a year to 60000 a year. Actually, as Mr. Dion told me, he was actually hired at $50,000 a year. Um, the radio program that Perry Long has uh, is not funded with CDA money, but it's funded by other grant money which is rapidly dwindling. And they use that to promote some of their programs that CD has, CDA has for housing programs, uh, including the Building Blocks program, uh, the First Time Homebuyers home program, and the Lead Abatement programs. Um, but in respect to Perry Long, because I had a problem because his salary did go up, that went up for other grant, for other grant money on their administrative costs and 
Michael Dion felt that, that it was appropriate to give him a raise. Um, because he actually worked on getting more grant money. And those grant monies have probably about $100,000 in administration out there. And so taking some of that money from administration and giving it to Perry Long, they felt was appropriate. Um, citizen residency isn't required for Perry Long's job. Uh, preference is given to a city resident, but it does not have to be uh, a city resident. And also, um, they don't have to make it um, necessarily for extremely low income or low income people. But again, preference is given to that. And I saw these preference sheets. It was very interesting to see the information. It was very interesting to get this report, which shows pictures of a lot of the programs um, that are available, the advertisements that were taken out, because I felt I didn't know about these advertisements. I, di I never saw them. I don't get the Herald News. Um, and I had mentioned that they didn't use the um, Fall River Government TV billboard or the Fall River Community Media billboard here on Channel 95. So they're going to look at using that again in the future uh, on future uh, announcements. But um, Chipper and I talked about this over the phone uh, since my meeting. And uh, we're going to go into what we call point counterpoint right now. So Chip, let me have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it will be my pleasure. Um, I am not going to, you know, uh, Mr. Dion uh, is, is uh, very, very good at, at uh, running the program. I don't have issue with Mr. Dion. I have issue with the program. I have issue with all these types of programs because all they are is a bureaucratic shell game and it costs everybody money and the the way they the way they cover their tracks is pretty easy they dazzle them or bore them with a bunch of statistics and a bunch of laws and percentages and 45 percent comes from here and 55 percent comes from there and don't worry about it it's grant money well guess what that's not grant money it's our money the only difference is it comes from our federal taxes or our state taxes rather than our local taxes so they, this is the way they, they, they kind of just say, hey, don't worry about anything. You know, this isn't really costing you anything. And we're doing a great job. But we're not doing a great job because as most federal programs, they have these criteria to meet to say they're doing their job. You have to bring in 100 jobs this year to the city of Fall River. But on the other side of that coin, it doesn't matter at all if you lose 3,000 jobs because we only care about the jobs you bring in. And we don't look at the types of jobs, how long we retain those jobs, if they are in fact viable jobs. We don't look at any of these criteria. All we do is look at this bull crap criteria to make, to justify their own existence and the existence of another waste of money because let's face it, Fall River has had the Office of Economic Disaster for decades and just take a look around I you know I agree with you on the floor of office of economic destruction disaster um, but you know when CDA started many years ago we used to have a CDA center down on County Street at 102 County Street which then eventually became was known as model cities it was known as the community development um, action center or, or, or something along that and then it became uh, health first now um, and Back then, and Michael Dion said it very clearly, I was a, a product of the Community Development Block Grant Fund. I went to County Street to get his teeth clean. He went to County Street for his physicals to see his doctor. And back then, that program was effectively run, and I think did a great job with dental, medical, legal, uh, WIC program. I mean, they had all of that there, and they were providing a service to the low-income people, and we could actually quantify it. But now we see all of these things that they're doing, like park benches and building parks, and those meet the requirements. Um, even though they say they're not meeting budget needs, city budget needs, it does seem that way at times. Um, but Mr. Dion is doing exactly what the program requires him to do. He's had five audits over the past six years, including one inspector general audit, and he has come back with few, if any, deficiencies at all. So he's doing the numbers. He's doing it right. Um, but that doesn't mean the people who are getting the money are doing it right, and I understand that. 
Uh, and again, how can you say that Florida Office of Economic Development is worth $380,000 a year on a community development block grant money when he's not retaining any jobs? Yes, he brought in 100 jobs, probably low-paying jobs, because in, in what I looked at on the list, they actually listed the jobs. Um, so he brought in 100, and he lost 2,500 or 3,000 jobs. So he's got a net loss of 2,900, but we can still give him the money for doing that. Yeah, well, that's, that's the issue I have, and you're right. Initially, uh, CDA was, was, was a very good program. Actually, I know uh, one of its first directors, Juan Delion, was a personal friend of mine. He grew up in the Flint with me. Um, I actually took his younger brother for his driving test. So I knew the Delions very well. Uh, that program was, uh, had a lot of help for, youth, for disadvantaged youth. It had a lot of very good programs, such as the medical coverage that Mr. Dion availed himself of. But this is the evolution of the government programs. They, they start out and they, they are really good and they, they're on point, but then they evolve into these bureaucracies where they begin to hide people, give them money, and then they run out of things to do and they begin to do things like park benches rather than, than, than meals on wheels or meals for children. They begin to do all these these little things to, to justify their own existence, their own paycheck. Do I blame Mr. Dion? No. He is going by the rules, but that's one of the problems. They, they, they tailored the rules to support themselves, just as our state legislature tailors the rules to help themselves. They have a different set of rules than the rest of the world. And government programs historically have begun as baseline programs and they've evolved into these giant upside down pyramids with tons of high paid bureaucrats running them. All we have to do on a local level is look at the school department. I know. And it, the thing is, is, you know, it bothers me to some respect because I had said in my response to this letter after my meeting with Mr. Dion, I had to send a letter to HUD and I said, I had the meeting with uh, Mr. Dion and it was very educational and it was, I learned a lot about this system. Um, but the problem I had initially was that Mr. Dion went to the mayor to tell the mayor I had filed this complaint and asked, what should I do? And the mayor said, answer his questions, which I'm very grateful he did say. But, you know, it leaves the question in the back of my mind, probably in the back of yours. What if the mayor said, don't tell him anything? Don't give him anything. What would have happened? I'm not saying that did happen. What I'm saying is the mayor said answer the questions, and I met with the mayor prior to my meeting with Mr. Dion, and the mayor did say, I want him to answer your questions honestly. And I asked him about the waivers, and he said, they're up in my office. Come upstairs and get them. Well, that's nice to hear. Um, but my problem is, is that they have all these wonderful programs, and uh, accordingly, they're saying Perry Long is doing a lot of this work. So I have to say that's, you know, that's a good thing. We're getting our money's worth out of them. Uh, they've got the buildings building blocks program which takes care of all those houses that they knock down and they fix up and repair and they actually got the pictures of all the houses here it's a great presentation he made here and he showed me and they gave me the dates and, and what happened and how it worked out um, and you know the development the neighborhood development programs and I said we're doing this and we're spending this money but what are we getting out of it and so he made sure he provided me the tree program the neighborhood garden program. These are all wonderful programs that they have. Um, and in 2013, this is what they funded. The establishment of a tool library, 25 neighborhood cleanups, one citywide cleanup. Creation of one urban tree farm with over 250 trees planted at various stages of growth. Creation of two community gardens with 24 raised beds. The cultivation of over 100 pounds of fresh produce going to low-income youth. Engaged approximately 1,415 volunteers. Collected approximately 2,072 bags of trash. Collected 51 tires. Removal of over 100 square feet of graffiti. In 2014, the grant funding will allow for 25 city blocks to be revitalized. 60,000 pounds of trash removed. Five green spaces created and enhanced. Two citywide cleanups conducted. 12, uh, 12 first Saturdays of service projects conducted with a focus on removing 500 square feet of graffiti. Wonderful programs, huh? Bravo. Bravo. However, my counterpoint is why is a federal agency 
doing planting trees in Fall River, cleaning up Fall River? Why isn't Fall River cleaning up Fall River? Why do we need these things? Why aren't federal programs earmarked to do things that Fall River doesn't do? This is the whole problem. We end up with duplications of effort do, and, and redundancies all over the place, as we have in a school department. As I said, on our local level, now we have deans of students and principals and assistant principals and, and uh, watchdogs for the assistant principals and, and whatever you want to do. And what that translates to is a waste of money. Is this program, is this program doing, what, is doing things? Yes. But what are they doing? Put it in perspective. And what are they doing it with? More of our money, more of our tax dollars. They're taking federal funds now, which have come from our federal tax dollars. Now, we've heard about the neighborhood groups, and we've seen how the mayor kowtows to the neighborhood groups. Why aren't the neighborhoods taking care of the cleanups in their neighborhoods? And, you know, I had that conversation with the mayor, too, because, you know, he has individuals which are very active and they're very connected to the mayor. Um, and even now they say the mayor isn't doing anything wrong. You know, take away the, the health plans and make them GIC. Those are all fine that they're saying. I'm not saying that they are. Um, and you have one neighborhood which, you know, fixed up a park, had it renamed. They clean up the neighborhoods. But they have a soup kitchen and a food pantry in their neighborhood. And you never see one of those people from that neighborhood group there. And it's right in their neighborhood, servicing their people in their neighborhood. Don't you think that that would be more of an active participation from the neighborhood group instead Absol of going out and collecting trash? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the fact is that, that as, I, as, as I said, my point is there are certain things that a, gov that a government is responsible for. That is the public safety, the public good. Now we have to pick up the trash. We don't need the bubonic plague sweeping Fall River. We already have enough of the of the political hack plague sweeping Fall River. Um, we, need, we need to protect our people from crime. We need to educate our people. But we don't need to do that by wasting money. These have to be priorities, and they are, they are the obligation, in my opinion, of government to provide. The, you, know, they, you know, this is why we pay taxes. Well, I'll give you one. And, you know, again, I'm playing devil's advocate here. But that CDA money helped buy fire engines. It helped buy fire department equipment. Did and, it not? And you are 100% right. And that goes back for, for literally decades. There was a time that the Fall River Fire Department, for over 20 years, had never purchased an engine with city money. And it was always done with CDA money. Is that a good thing? No. And I will tell you why. Because once we freed up the money, and took away the obligation of this city to prioritize getting equipment like police cars, we end up with them taking that money and spending it on something else. And then when it comes time that you have to pay for your own fire engines and for your own police cars, the taxpayer takes the hit again. I agree. I do agree with that. I mean... And now they can't buy equipment anymore. Now they can float them alone off the CDA money. Uh, I think it's called a 108 loan or something. And that money is used to pay the interest on the loan. So they take a bond, the CDA pays the interest. And so that's a good thing, bad thing, I don't know. But again, we're getting away, away from being self-supportive. And it, it's scary when you think about that. Other things that the CDA program has done is a drug initiative. We have everybody doing drug initiatives. Do we need them? Yes, no, I, you know, don't get me going on it. I mean, my dog found a bag of, of heroin, and I wasn't happy about that. Um, but we need to do something so that accountability is there, not just handing it out. And I said in my response to HUD that this is something that can't be fixed at the local level. This cannot be fixed by Michael Dion or the CDA here. It has to be taken up by our legislators, which, you, as you know, don't want to do that because, ooh, we might tick somebody off and we won't get reelected. <laughs> and then we can't take care of ourselves, which they, which they are. That is what they are at really best at, um, you know, and, and w we will get into that in another program because I have some statistics here that are mind-boggling on how these, these uh, senators and reps uh, take care of themselves. 
when they're in office, when they're out of office, and then they, then they have the, the unmitigated gall and audacity to say things like, well, the GIC is good enough for me, but so it's good enough for them. But they're not a pensioner who gets uh, a COLA of $360 a year, which is less than a dollar a day. Uh, I have a former state senator who, who in, in three years got a 17% increase in her base salary. That's not counting the per diem that she gets. Exactly. And now she has a job with this college that she has to show up four times a year for. She's mandated to show up at least four times a year. And her salary has started at 114, well, almost 115, 114, 752, then jumped to 125. Now, it is, now it's 129. So, yeah, of course she can afford the co-pays because not only is she, has she bumped up her pension about 25%, She's collecting a paycheck for 130 grand a year after she was out of office. And she doesn't have to do anything. And when they boot, when they get booted out of office, for all you, for all you listeners out there, I want to get you even more upset. When you get fired, you can't go down to the Social Security and file a claim because you'll get fired. When they get booted out of office, they can collect because they're considered displaced workers. So the next time you get fired, go down to the Social Security <laughs> office. File your claim and say, I didn't get fired. I got displaced. That's right. I'm a displaced worker. I mean, think about it. It's, it's rather funny. Um, no, but it's, it's amazing um, how all of a sudden um, we are getting to, the, to some real, you know, meat and potatoes of the issues going on in our city. And as you and I both know, we seem to have ruffled the feathers of many people on many levels of, of city government. Because we're not playing games here, and we really, we really aren't. Um, but one of the things I did want to bring up, um, now that the CDA thing, and, and I will say, for the record, Mr. Dion, um, I really appreciate what you did for me, and you showed me everything that the CDA program does, and the community development block grant money does, and the regulations behind it. Um, and I will say this for the record, I think you're probably one of the most <coughs> honest people I know uh, in city hall and in city government. Uh, you don't pull punches, you laid it out on the line and you had no problems with it at all. And you didn't take this personally as, as neither did I. Um, and because again, business is business, personal is personal, and that's the way it should be. Uh, but I wanna commend you on your job and what you do for the city. Um, I received a couple of phone calls yesterday and I spoke with you about it as well in regards to what's going on with these negotiations with the fire department. What is happening here? I have people saying, you know, I'm not being represented who work for the fire department. I have people being saying, we know nothing about what's going on. What's happening? Nobody wants to talk about this. Well, apparently the, the, the mayor is, is beginning to feel the pressure of, of, the, of the public relations campaign of, of the firefighters union. And he's gonna call them in and make, uh, try to make a deal to make this go away. I think he's, to be perfectly truthful, I think he's afraid that uh, uh, they will be involved in a recall uh, if, if he doesn't make a deal. And he realizes that they were instrumental in, in, in getting 10,000 signatures uh, after the Coogan debauchery um, and, and to remove the fire chief. So uh, I don't think he wants, he, I, I think he, he realizes he's, he's getting a lot of scrutiny, a lot of heat. Uh, as with you, I'm kind of in the dark now. I know that there's, there are talks going on. I've heard some rumors and, you know, we can't say, you know, we can't, we will never represent uh, rumors as facts here. I have heard rumors about an increase in the Manning uh, to a number which actually was a number that I had stipulated uh, in my discussions with him and also when I talked to the executive board of the fire union. Um, we have a lot of talk. I guess we'll know more after, by tomorrow because I have been told there is a union meeting tonight, and I guess whatever has gone on between the mayor and the president and vice president of the union in their talks, and I believe they had a talk yesterday morning while we were meeting on the insurance, um, I believe that um, you know, we will get some, some feedback from the people at the, who were told what went on at the union meeting. But is there a question about how this is being done? 
I mean, isn't there a formal procedure that's supposed to be followed or, or a, uh, a legal procedure that's supposed to be followed when you're renegotiating your contracts for your, your unions or your, you know, your, your rank and file? Well, yeah, there is a procedure. It, it's based on the, on the Constitution and, and bylaws of the, of the local, and I know that the, unless it's been changed, when I was the president for 24 years, um, you had to have a bargaining committee. The composition of the bargaining committee was the four chair officers, the president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and then three members that were voted in from the body at large. Uh, and that seven member bargaining committee uh, was the committee that entered into collective bargaining then to bring anything that was negotiated back to the body for ratification. Now, the mayor is meeting with only the vice president and the president, so I guess some people could uh, question whether that's right or not. I can't, really, I can't really say because if they meet with him and he proposes some issues that are bargainable, if they didn't agree to them and they said, okay, now that you've proposed this, we're going to bring it back to the membership, and if the membership agrees we want to talk about it, we will create the bargaining committee, then it's okay. If they say, you know, we're going to do this without going through the bargaining committee, then it's a question of impropriety. Hmm. It's very interesting. Uh, it's amazing the stuff you learn from you, Chipper, I'll tell you. You know, uh, 24 years uh, as a union president, you kind of know the ins and outs of this. So it's always nice to have a, an expert on hand to, to handle these questions. Um, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, just for people out there to know, uh, the real estate committee is meeting next week, and I received the documents on it already. Um, two of the properties have already been transferred to the city for $175,000. One, the city didn't pay for it all. And now the city is going to discuss possibly taking the other unit, the other pieces of land by eminent domain. My question is, who's paying for it? Where's it coming from? I think that's a great question because I don't think either of us have any idea. And I'm not even sure if the city has any idea. They don't. They, there's no idea. And the funny part about it is the diocese said, we'll meet with you and discuss it. So why would you even slap them in the face and say, we're going to take it by eminent domain? I know why. Emerald Gordet. <laughs> well, that, that's my issue with the thing. You know, we, we, you know, as much if I did, you know, I may disagree with the mayor on most things, um, and I may disagree with the council uh, at times. However, I mean, my disagreement is based on, on the issue at hand and the decisions they make as our elected representatives. If they're not representing us in our best interest, I will be there complaining. However, when someone from the, from the citizenry basically dictates what's, what the city is going to do, not the city council or the mayor, who are our elected officials, uh, then I have a problem with uh, maybe having undue influence because they're from a neighborhood group, and, and this has always been a problem with me. I don't like uh, this concept. We had neighborhood groups for years. Uh, they, they pleaded their case, and the decisions were made by the mayor or the city council. Now it seems that they are uh, a political faction, and they have their own agenda, which is compartmentized, and I don't believe that's good for the city as a whole. I agree. Well, thank you for watching, and we'll be back next week uh, with another show. And actually, it's probably going to be later on this week, uh, now that we're going to two shows a week. So thank you for watching. Have a great day. Stay active.